So welcome everybody to the Skagit Valley and Whidbey March 2021 clinic. You're here on Zoom. Uh, we are a function of the National Model Railroad Association, part of the fourth division in the Pacific Northwest region. I'm Rich Blake, the clinic chair. And uh, <clears throat> this month, our clinic is gonna be on the El Waco Railway and Navigation Company. And it'll be presented by Mark Clemens who lives in uh, Oysterville. He's one of the um, members of the Pacific Northwest Owen 30 modular group. He's also uh, involved with um, one of the Fremo InScale groups. He also works in Astoria, volunteers to uh, restore one of the locomotives they have there. Um, and he also volunteers at the uh, local museum, Pacific County Museum in uh, El Waco. Where one of the IR and N narrow gauge um, coaches is stored there. The railroad that ran by the tides was the North Beach Peninsula's IR and N. This is the North Beach Peninsula, which some people like to call the Long Beach Peninsula, but those of us up in the North End who don't live in Long Beach uh, refer to it as the North Beach Peninsula because that's what it is officially and or the Discovery Coast. Home of the Chinook Nation in 1792, Captain Robert Gray found our place up here, down here. Uh, 1805 was Lewis and Clark came through. The Astor Party in 1811, Hudson's Bay Company in 1813. The first settlers in the 40s and Oysterville was settled in 1854. This uh, fella, Louis Alfred Loomis, uh, and his brother settled on the peninsula and um, raised sheep on the peninsula uh, in from the dunes. Uh, there's a shot of sheep in the area. Actually, I think this is over by Nacelle, Nacelle but it's close to where we are. Lewis Loomis founded the Iwaka Wharf Company by selling shares and stock to raise money for a pier. The story was when he and his brother took the wool to go to market, they, they had to meet the boats or a small boat that came in. There was no landing in Iwaka and so the, the wool would get wet. So Loomis was an, in, an innovative kind of guy and he formed this company to build a pier so they wouldn't have to get the, sheet, the wool wet. And the wharf brings commerce and people to the area. Um, they build a wharf with a freight or a warehouse on it. And uh, uh, so the ships would come in and out and lots of people used it. Uh, in 1875, then, he purchased uh, the passenger vessel Canby, which was a passenger tug, and founded the Iwaka Steam Navigation Company. Um, about the same time, he, uh, he was running a um, stage company up and down the peninsula. The only problem is the only the only route for a stage on the peninsula was the beach. And of course at high tide, you have trouble run, running a stage on the beach. A little bit of extra information. He, uh, uh, the stage um, in running the length of the peninsula, they would basically have to change horses about halfway up the peninsula. So it was a, a pretty long uh, trip up the peninsula. So, but he put the whole thing together and uh, the pier, the boats, and the stage, and he had complete control of, As of transportation from Astoria to Oysterville. In fact, he ran a couple of his competitors into the ground. Um, and then uh, there was a couple of other folks that um, were running stages and that, but um, Loomis did a pretty decent job, I guess. And, uh, so then his next, next step was to get the mail contract that would to carry 
a mail from Astoria to Olympia. And he enlisted a couple of uh, oystermen. They had Krellens. Um, there were a couple that build, had built a couple of big houses in Oysterville and that, but they made their money and actually moved to San Francisco. They were in San Francisco when he contacted them to put up the money for the stage contract. And uh, so he got that stage contract and, or the mail contract and uh, uh, basically had the whole control of, of mail and, and actually people as well from, from Astoria to Olympia. As I said before, the only road was the beach at that time. And it was not the best road for the stagecoaches. And um, as the peninsula got more and more popular, now that he had boats that were coming across from Astoria, um, and actually some of the boats started coming down all the way from Portland to Iowaco, there were more and more people and the stagecoach couldn't handle the traffic. So he looked to figure uh, a better way to get up the peninsula. At this point in time, um, uh, the UP for one was uh, converting over from, um, from narrow gauge to uh, standard gauge. Uh, so there was a fair amount of narrow gauge equipment available. They figured the cost would be about $5,000 a mile and he actually enlisted uh, R.H. Espy, who was the co-founder of Oysterville, um, to help support the railroad with the idea that he was going to run the railroad from Milwaukee to Oysterville. Um, as it turned out, the cost of the railroad was more than $5,000 a mile, but uh, and so he ended up raising more money. So basically this was the pier in El Waco and it was running, the railroad was to run from there. And eventually it, uh, well, they were headed to deep water and shoal water bay. Um, they discovered that the closest point uh, from the deep water in, in Willapa Bay or shoal water bay as it was known then uh, was actually at Nakata and not up at Oysterville. So they ended up uh, sort of short changing the Oysterville folks and uh, terminating in Nakata. The first run by July of 1888, uh, they had progressed as far as Long Beach with the track and um, they had some flat cars that they put benches and canopies on and ran train had a big celebration. And of course, the in the speeches, they were talking about how they were eventually going to have railroad connection all the way from San Francisco to, to Oysterville uh, on the, with the railroad. Uh, this was 1888. Uh, in the next year, they managed to extend the line all the way to Nakata. This is a picture of the first train at Nakata. Um, as you can see, there wasn't much there, lots of woods. There's a, another shot of Nakata at uh, about that same time, 1889. Um, actually here they've got wood piled up for the, uh, uh, for the train for the locomotives. The first couple of locomotives were wood burners, um, a bit of a train shed here. And actually you can see the, uh, edge of the um, turntable, which is the, where the turntable got built at, in Nakata. At that time, Ilwaco was pretty, pretty much a thriving town. Um, this is, I think, a little bit later, but not much. Uh, the high school or the school up here on the hill and a um, fair number of houses in Ilwaco at that point and a pretty substantial pier that they built. Um, they had to go quite a ways out to get to deep water in Iwako. 
Um, this is uh, locomotive number one. In uh, this is in El Waco. There's another shot in El Waco. Um, I don't know if you folks know this is this is basically one block up from where the traffic light is uh, over at the, in this at the next corner, you know, at the corner of El Waco and First Street. This is First Street that runs down to the harbor in El Waco today. They had the turntable, water tank, and uh, pretty rudimentary uh, facilities here. This is a shot looking up, going up First Street towards, um, we're going north out of town. They just basically a stage, stage office and a hotel. Uh, I think the post office is labeled over there. Another shot in Iwako. This is looking south down First Street. This is a little later. Uh, the main intersection here. Actually, this is a bit later. Uh, the passenger station is here um, to the right as you're looking south. The railroad tracks came down this way and then down right down the middle of First. At the north end, uh, originally there were two towns. Um, had been settled by or developed by two different folks. Uh, there was a bit of a, a rivalry between the two, the two, uh, the owners of basically the owners of the land there, and they were fighting over who would, who would get the railroad. Um, it turned out the fella on the south side of of the street coming into Nakata or the rail line coming in the Nakata donated land for the railroad. And so he went out and actually uh, he was the Nakata half of the town and uh, Sealand basically disappeared or the name disappeared um, after the railroad was pretty well established there. This is, um, this is what was Railroad Avenue when uh, we first got to the peninsula before the county named all the or numbered all the streets. Um, Nakata on the south side here, uh, Sealand over on this side. I think this is the Sealand Hotel. Um, this was a the train station here and the general merchandise store. And the dock, the rail line ran out onto the dock. Uh, where they where you could transfer over to the boats. There's a shot on the dock. I think this is locomotive number two and a couple of the um, uh, rail cars there. And there's a flat car on the siding, on this side of the. Looks like it may be loaded with lumber. This is a brochure or, or a flyer for the for the railroad and for their uh, steamers. At this point, they had uh, two steamers running across from Astoria. Um, I believe uh, they started out with just a one day trip, one trip a day. And then I think later they went to two trips a day across. Yeah, on in, in here, <laughs> well, two round trips on Thursdays, but you had to, had to uh, make sure that the tides were right to be able to get. The problem was not getting in and out of Astoria, it was getting in and out of, of Iwako because of the shallow um, harbor in Iwako. Um, on the screen share like this, you can, you I'm, I'm blocked with some of my stuff on it that but you can, you guys can see the whole, the full screen. Yeah, that's yeah. all we see yeah. is your Resume. screen. All we see is your PowerPoint screen. Yeah, but I mean, you can, you can see the full poster here. I've got stuff in front of it on in the bottom of my screen. Yeah, we can okay. see the whole thing. Um, Mark on the upper right okay. says- Business was booming in the nineties uh, and the, the railroad prospered at this time too. This was just um, locomotive number two 
headed southbound down the peninsula. Um, the combination coach and the, okay. Um, they started out with um, used equipment. A lot of it came up out of, out of um, well, Union Pacific Control Railroads out of Utah and the like. But um, one, of the, one of the board members on the railroad convinced Loomis that they ought to have some new equipment. So they, he went back to Jackson and Sharp, bought one combination car here and three passenger cars. And then they bought one passenger car from um, the Pullman Company in Chicago. So the railroad had four, basically, um, three, four, five, five brand new cars and everything else was used equipment. So this is a, this is a shot of the um, car in, uh, in Delaware. They basically uh, were loaded on the big flat cars and then Northern Pacific delivered them um, uh, to uh, what you call it? The, basically the Columbia River and then they came on on scout with a scow down the river to the railroad in Iwaco. Um, there were lots of visitors to the beach, and uh, kids rode the the train to school. Um, here's a shot of of oyster um, barges on the um, on the bay on Willapa Bay. Uh, oysters were carried uh, quite a bit on the uh, on the train. I think there was one one train or one day a week was the oyster train, um, and of course it was probably not a good one a good one to be riding on. Could have could have had a little bit of smell. <laughs> uh, this is a shot of clamming on the peninsula at that time. Commercial clamming was a big deal. And of course, they hauled cranberries too. And there's a shot in the cranberry field, the bog. Carried the mail, carried milk. Um, they carried some dairy um, food for some of the dairy cattlemen too. Um, brought hay um, north from, from the river. There were a few setbacks. Um, the track was basically just laid on the sand, um, you know, ties directly on the sand. And uh, I don't know how many times they um, derailed, but um, we know of at least one here. Doesn't pay to run over the when the sand is drifted over the tracks. This is one that's a pretty infamous one too. Apparently they were backing the train out onto the dock in uh, Iwaco and uh, it collapsed. And uh, they, were, they were able to save this car and, uh, and the equipment. There's no record of any losses, uh, any loss of life or equipment, but. <clears throat> By 1900, uh, they had they would, as you can see, three engines, eight passenger cars, 12 box cars, eight flat cars, the two steamers, and the docks at both ends of that. The total value of about two hundred and forty-eight thousand um, dollars. The Oregon Railway Navigation Company came in and uh, bought them out. Loomis was paid 142,000 for his interest in the company. We don't have records of who else who else received money from um, from the sale, but um, Union Pacific took it over as the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company. Under that new management, um, they put in telephone lines, uniforms for the crew, new equipment. Expanded, separated, had separate passenger trains from the freight trains rather than just combined trains. And the 
pretty infamous thing here when one of the new superintendents inspected it. He asked, was asked what he was thought. His only statement was a clamshell railroad. And that I think is where <laughs> the name clamshell railroad came from. Um, for a while, they carried transloaded logs, carried them across from Willapa Bay or from Shoalwater Bay across to Iwako. There's a shot of the train on the dock in Iwako. Um, you talk about the, the railroad that ran by the tides. If you look at this train schedule, you can see there's a half hour, well, actually more than a half hour on some days, but about each each day of the week or of the week and of the month, the train left uh, or the boats left Astoria and they left the Owaco dock uh, later each day and because of the tide, the, the shed, the boat could only come into the dock at Owaco at a high tide. And so they adjusted the railroad schedule to go along with the boat schedule. In 1907, they decided to expand the railroad and actually to push it upriver to deep water. Um, so these are shots. Um, this is the tunnel under Fort Columbia uh, when they're excavating it there. And uh, that's the dot or the station in Chinook. So they pushed the railroad to deep water at Megler. Uh, Megler's, uh, where's my, Megler down here is uh, um, pretty close to where, or just a little bit um, upriver from where the, where the bridge crosses from Astoria today. Um, is where the, dot, where the terminus was. I put in here, um, um, basically the mileposts on the railroad, um, Nakata dock at this end coming down to Iwako and from, or I guess this reads the other way around, excuse me, from Megler at milepost zero uh, to Iwako Junction is at Black Lake, um, which is just north, north of Iwako and then on the way up to Nakata, 27 miles in total. This is the dock at uh, Megler. Um, they, the boats could tie up on both sides of the dock or of, yeah. And uh, in fact, I think they generally brought the passenger vessels in on the, on the east side, on the upriver side, um, of course the current in the river would hold the boat tight against the um, against the pier. Um, in this case, it looks like they've got passenger cars on uh, both sides of the pier. Uh, there are other shots where uh, there are box cars on the um, west side of the pier. There's a shot of the train waiting for the boat um, on the east side of the pier. Another shot of the pier box car on the on the west side and uh, pretty you know it was a pretty substantial freight house here on the on the pier another shot there's a little later there's electric lights on the pier <coughs> and once they had extended to Megler they got rid of the turntable in El Waco and they put new turntable at uh, Megler uh, and uh, fuel tanks, uh, oil tanks and water tank uh, there. Um, took out the turntable in Iwako. And in fact, from that, this point on, they, the trains at Iwako basically backed in from the Y at, at Black Lake. Okay, I'm going through the rail stops going um, from Megler through the railroad. This is McGowan. McGowan is where the church today is. Um, 
And uh, this was basically a cannery, a small, not really a town, but a cannery. Um, and just the people that lived and worked in the cannery or lived adjacent to and worked in the cannery. Whoop, went the wrong way, sorry. <laughs> this is an aerial view of McGowan. Um, a bit later, because here the, the road has been developed as well, but there's the tracks right along where the, the road basically runs along here today. Um, the pier uh, for the fish cannery at McGowan. And you go in, we're headed west. This is the tunnel under Fort Columbia uh, at this point. And well, the railroad built the tunnel and then eventually it, when the railroad went away, the tunnel was expanded for the roadway. The roadway today goes through that same place. There's a stop in Fort Columbia, nice little station, um, facilities in the back too. Whoop, they're coming out, looking back at the tunnel. Next stop was Chinook. Chinook was already a pretty well-established town at this point. Um, in fact, um, it was a pretty rich town, probably the richest town on the, in this corner of the world because of the salmon. You can see the, uh, the salmon, um, they net or they uh, fish, had fish traps to trap the salmon here. Um, this building still exists. Uh, in Chinook, uh, but because this was already an established town, they didn't bring the railroad through the main the main street of town like um, they did in other places. But the railroad is act was actually built um, about two blocks to the to the north or east. Uh, well, that's not east. That's I guess that's north here still. The way the Chinook rides. Here's a shot of folks walking over towards the railroad, where the railroad station was. Whoop, there's a Chinook station and a couple of trains at Chinook. Not very many pictures in our, anywhere that we've been able to find of the track work and the, and, um, or people working on the trains. And it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of that kind of documentation. Moving further up the line, this is basically the Y that was built at Black Lake or it's called Iwako Junction, they called it on the railroad. Um, so from that, this point on the train, the train would back down into, into Iwako. Here's a shot of Black Lake, the tracks along the west side of the lake. Another shot pretty early on, muddy street or muddy roadway. Uh, but at one point, in order to provide safety for the folks at these crossings and on this roadway, the railroad was required to put a fence down between the, between the tracks and the, and the road. There they upgraded the road a bit with the uh, plank road. And you can see the tracks right alongside. There's another shot from the other end. Took a detour down into Owaco. Here's the Owaco passenger station. Uh, shot down Main Street. Um, if you, any of you know Iwako, these two buildings still exist there. Um, this was the DuPay hardware store, or DuPay Brothers. Um, and then this was the Oddfellows building. Um, pa that passenger station is right over on this side. And this walkway that we're standing on is going up to the freight depot, which uh, and probably the photographer was on the deck of the freight depot at this point. There's a shot of the freight house and the, and the passenger station. 
This is later um, where the um, pier has been removed. Uh, I think it basically de fell apart. A uh, new pier out to cannery buildings and the like was built over there. Uh, but basically then this became just, they were platform for the sawmill that was right next door here. There's the, one of the few sh pictures that we have of, of a caboose or the caboose on the IRNN. Uh, this is their loading lumber onto cars uh, at the lumber yard there in El Waco. Next up the line um, is um, next major stop. There was a, actually a water stop at Holman, which is just before Seaview, but Seaview is a station. Um, this is pretty early on. No road, no vehicles, motor vehicles at this point. Drainage ditch right alongside the railroad. Seaview uh, Station, that building um, still exists. We have more pictures of it as well. Um, as you can see here on that, um, on this, you can't see in this picture, but on this picture, you can see the the freight end of the uh, the north end of the depot was open, an open freight area apparently. Um, there's a, this was known as the Hackney Cottage. Uh, it's a pretty large cottage, but it's just, just up from the Seaview Station. Here's another shot of Seaview where the, these are all basically all vacation cottages that were built. Uh, folks came over, uh, families came over for the summer, even if dad had to work, he'd come out, come out on weekends, but um, uh, the families uh, were out here where it's much cooler than it was in town in Portland and the like. There was a stop for the Shelburne Hotel, which was, Shelburne is still there today. Uh, and then you come on past there into Long Beach. Uh, this is the Long Beach Station. Uh, actually, I think well, well before automobiles, um, the city of Long Beach uh, allowed them to build the station. In the, they closed off an east-west road and let them build in what was the platted roadway here, with the idea that. Um, uh, I think they required them to put another track around behind the station. And uh, I don't know, there were some other conditions in here, but you can see milk cans on the, on the platform at the station. Looks like lumber on the other end of the station there. Um, there are power lines here. Here's a shot, again, before the motor vehicles. Um, <laughs> All you had was the railroad tracks and the station, and you could practically step from the boardwalk on the west side, well, from either side. Um, I think basically this is boardwalk in here too. I know it comes around the corner, and in fact, uh, I think the next shot is of the, what was Tinker's Hotel and became the Long Beach Hotel, but you can see they're just the tracks and, um, Plank, planked walkways on either side. This was the Portland Hotel, just a little bit further north. Um, we can see that the train is sitting at the, <coughs> at the um, depot where you saw it in the previous picture where it was in right in the middle of the street. Uh, next stop up is the breakers. Uh, the tracks are right along this side of the breakers. Uh, we'll get another shot. Um, actually, let's go back. This was the original breakers. It burned, um, I think, in early, in the teens, I think. This was the rebuilt breakers. 
As you can see, they put a water tower on the roof for fire protection, but it didn't really help because this one also burned. Um, now that's, you know, there's some other, there'll be some other shots, I think, of the breakers. Next step, stop up was Loomis, Loomis Station, Loomis's mansion or house. The house that he established there was actually, um, I think, originally located there, well, for a couple of reasons, but one is that's where they had to change, they changed horses on the stage runs that were running up the beach. So um, and there's another shot, a shot of the railroad and lovely, lovely photographs, not much to be said for quality of old photos, but you can see there's a windmill here and some barns, some pretty good sized barns. Um, but this was his home and, you know, the people ask, well, why, why would the train stop for, for the, at the owner's place? But, um, you know, that's the privilege of owning the railroad, I guess. Lots of things to see on the beach. Uh, this one, the ship Alice was up at Ocean Park. It's where it went aground. A couple of shots of whales beached. Uh, next shot, stop up was Clipson. Uh, Clipson was the where the life saving station was located. It had originally been down at El Waco, but uh, because of wrecks all up and down the the beach that was relocated up to Clips and I think it was still called the Owaco Beach Station or Owaco Life Saving Station, but it was located up at Clips and a um, couple of the buildings from the station uh, up there still exist. There's some shots of the guys at the track at the front, at the station. Um, and one of the one of the things interesting things for the tourists or for the folks that were out there for the summertime was uh, come up on Sunday and they had lifeboat demonstrations for the folks to watch. And this is a shot of the folks uh, waiting to board the train to go back down into Seaview in Long Beach. Ocean Park is an Basically, the northern part, part of the track going running, running up the peninsula, and then at Ocean Park, uh, there were quite a few summer homes there. It was a pretty, pretty nice uh, place to have a to have a play. Well, still is, I guess, <laughs> to come for the summertime to come and enjoy the beach. Um, this hotel and uh, this building here, which is over here in this. Well, it's actually the two buildings together was uh, the Taylor Hotel. Um, this this building still exists today, um, just a block west of the, the intersection where the light is in uh, Ocean Park. This was the Ocean Park um, train station. There's folks gathered at the station. Another shot of the train in at the station in Ocean Park. This is one of the later shots, but um, more typically the size of the train in its later days, sometimes actually only one coach. This one is interesting to those of us that uh, have researched the railroad in that there are three different coaches here one of, this is our Pullman coach, the Nakata. Uh, one of them's a Jackson and Sharp, and the other one is a uh, um, Carter Brothers car out of California. <laughs> so three different makers, three different coaches on this train. Nakata is the terminus and the point of the maintenance facilities up there. Um, Basically, a car barn here with two tracks in it, a turntable, a three stall um, roundhouse, and uh, a shot of the turntable and the car barn behind it. And they're turning 
number five, I think it is. This was the largest locomotive in the fleet. And didn't get used a lot because basically, the, as you can see, the track's pretty, um, I think it was originally 35 pound track here uh, on the north end. And they used heavier track, I think 65 pound track on the extension that went out east. But uh, um, this big locomotive was not, didn't do very well with the track as light as it was. So they didn't use number six a lot. In 1915, there was a fire in Nakato and uh, it pretty much destroyed uh, the town. It was interesting, it didn't go uh, too far. It did not get to the, it burned, this was where the, this was the railroad, the train station here, but the car barn and the turntable and that uh, were spared. The fire did not go any further west than here. In fact, that house back there didn't get burned, but the hotels that are behind us and the store behind us, there's the car barn you can see, pretty much flattened the rest of the town, but they were quick to rebuild. Um, this house almost looks like they may have built it and trucked it in. They put it up in a hurry. There's a new station being built here. You can see the, the Moorhead store that was here on the corner and the other hotel um, are gone, not to be built back for a while. There's the new station under construction. Here's a family waiting to go on the train including with the canary, canary in the cage. In the 20s, all of a sudden, um, automobiles began to take over. In Long Beach, this is what it was before the automobile. This is what was after the automobile. They basically moved the buildings back. As you can see the uh, Train station is still there, the tracks are still here, but they made room for the automobile. Likewise in uh, Seaview. And Iwako. Um, actually, this is after concrete pavement, um, but um, I think they were actually, yeah, when they widened the street out here, they actually planked it for a while. Little fella in the middle of the street enjoying himself. Um, this is uh, where the automobile took over in Ocean Park. That's the station. The station was originally open in front and then they enclosed it so they could have an enclosed baggage area in front. This is um, store, which basically this building is part of Jack's Country Store now today. And there's a gas pump here, and um, as you can see, automobiles taking over. Here's one of the first ferries um, that came into um, McGowan at the dock, which had been the cannery dock before. But um, that's where the first one, ferries landed there, carry a few automobiles on this little open and open deck thing. Um, I don't have the year on this, but given crossings, they got three crossings a day on weekends and Monday, uh, two crossings in the, in the middle of the week, 15 cars on the trip. Then even uh, Union Pacific got into the, uh, into the business of carrying cars as well. You can see they put, put a road in alongside, the tracks are there in the road up, to put it up the beach as you saw in the earlier shot of McGowan uh, and the Union Pacific car ferry to North Beach. Uh, whoop. They modified the dock 
at Megler to for the ferry slip here. Um, the railroad dock is on this side. This was they put this slip on the west side of the existing pier. There you can see uh, the car slips there, and then they brought the vehicles around this way. Tracks are still in play here, although looks like they're not. It may not have been used at this point. I don't know the date of the photo. Note on the timetable here, the entire rail service is to be discontinued on September 10th, um, 1930, I believe. Yep, September 9th, 1930, last run of the train. It was gone but not forgotten. Um, the last train. What's left of the railroad today? Not much. In fact, this cabin here, which was um, the railroad tracks, ran in the in the area right down where the photographer's standing here. Um, this was the car rail car was moved just up onto the sand dune. Uh, and then enclosed and used as a cabin, but this is now gone uh, within the last year. This is in downtown Seaview, one of the Jackson and Sharp cars uh, still exists. Um, and our little car, the Nakata, uh, which is the Pullman car, is in the museum uh, in Iwako. Likewise, this is the freight depot from Milwaukee. It's in the museum as well. Um, in fact, the Nakata sits on the track on the ties that were right, right here when this shot was taken. <laughs> the depot, um, this, this I leave in as the depot tavern is now the depot restaurant. But when we first got moved to the peninsula, it was pretty much a Coast Guard hangout um, as a depot tavern, but it was a nice place, nice place to have a beer. Um, an interesting thing, the this decorative, the timbers up here, the planks up here with the cutouts in it, um, the, the shot of the depot in Seaview early on, this decorative, planking was above the open air uh, freight depot. And now even today, I think I've got a shot of the restaurant. Yeah, um, the depot restaurant, uh, if you go there today, you can still see the cutouts in that, the original wood up there in the top part of the structure. That's all that's left. Well, and there isn't that much left today. This was where the pier was in Nakata. Um, going out into the bay. And there is all that's left, uh, remnants of what was at Megler. Um, not much to show for what was the railroad. So that's it. Excellent, Mark. That's very, very interesting stuff. And it's like, right here in our own state. It's too bad they didn't, yeah, take, they didn't, uh, didn't take as many pictures as like, you know, Colorado lines and stuff to preserve that history. Yeah, it is, it is kind of sad. I mean, there are, you know, I put this together to be able to show in, in 45 minutes, there are more photos available, but not a lot. I mean, I try to find, you know, pictures of the track work and that, I don't know that I've seen any pictures other than the ones on the dock at Megler where you can see a, a switch or a switch machine. You know, just nobody documented that stuff. So there's no Sanborn maps available or anything like that from the time period? Um, in Iwako, and we do, we do have a set of 400 scale uh, basically the right-of-way maps for the railroad. So we do have, we know where the track was, 
you know, but but no real detail of the construction, you know, stuff. What we've gleaned, most of what we've gleaned, the guys did looking up um, the books, see what, you know, when they were buying, buying stuff and equipment and that, you know, supplies and the like. There's more documentation in that respect than there is in the way of photographs. So Mark? Yeah. Well, Alan Murray here. Um, I have four years where I know there's a July 24th, if you want to figure that time card out. 1920, well, 1915, 1920, 1926, and 1937. Oh, really? Hmm. So anyway, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I recall at one point, I think you said that the towns were built close to the shore as the railroad right. was. And now we've had, you know, uh, almost 100 years of accretion uh, out there <clears throat> for the folks. How far is, what's the difference in distance from the beach that uh, say um, <clears throat> Long Beach is, you know, well, from today? I'd say probably somewhere in the neighborhood of three quarters of a mile to a mile. And well, maybe not a mile. The one that, one that is, mo well, the one, at, the one at Long Beach, when the, I don't know if you, if you go out there where they, there's the, the archway over the beach, the, even in the late, 40s, early 50s, the beach was, the breakers would come right up to there. And now it's, you know, probably a quarter mile, half mile out beyond that, where you drive out to turn around in that. And there's hotels and condominiums built in that area on the accreted land. And that's partially, well, the volume coming down the Columbia is still substantial. Right. Even, with all, even with all the dams. Right. But then you have the effect of the jetties possibly that depends I on think, that. I think the jetties were a bigger effect than just what was naturally. I mean, the material was coming down the Columbia, but once the North Jetty was built, that really caused a lot to be deposited on the beach. That's because the littoral drift is from North to South, right? No, the other way around, I think. Anyway. Something to Something think about. It's a, know, I, it's a lot of sand. It's a lot of sand. A lot of sand. So I know you didn't cover the, the jetties out there, Mark, but I mean, there was a lot of interesting narrow gauge railroading to build those. Yeah. When, when were those, when, what was the time period that those were, those were built? I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. You know, Gary Kobis put together a couple of a couple of presentations on the jetties, on jetty construction. Um, I don't know. I don't know that he is up to giving any of those, but I know he shared some of some of his stuff with me because I, I, he's got a, a treatise on, you know, all six of the, well, six actually. There were what eight or nine because a couple of the locomotives were renumbered, but one through six of the locomotives, you know, and where they came from and, you know, their history and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, that in and of itself would make a good presentation if one's in the locomotives. <laughs> it seems like he gave a presentation at one, at Railroad Days, one of them uh, about the jetty construction. Was, yeah, yeah, he did. Was. He did. I, I sat through some of it. I guess it depends on what you're interested in. Yeah, like yeah. You're a really narrow gauge is. locomotive guy. I was like, wow, this is cool, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the fact that they built they basically built a piling structure out there with tracks on top, then hauled the rock out and dumped it in to cover up, you know, put in a put in a mat of, of stuff down underneath and pile rocks on either side of the of the causeway that they just built, you know, to fill it in. Pretty interesting construction. All right. Anybody else got any questions for Mark on the 
on the IR and N? Mark, this yeah. is uh, Al Carter from uh, Mount Vernon. And I wondered if you ever ran into a fellow named Henry Wellzell that lived in uh, Puyallup because way back in the 80s, maybe it was in the 90s, Roger Ferris and I were uh, doing some rail fanning and it, Roger was a guy that knew everybody. And he took me to Henry's house in Puyallup, but kind of the outskirts, and Henry had restored a uh, IRNN uh, coach. I mean, to the point of the seats inside the cast iron, um, I don't know what you call them, ends of the bench seats. He had actually uh, had those cast to, in, in, in the process of rebuilding uh, this coach. He was a retired farmer. He was probably in his high 80s when I met him, but he'd done all this work, most of it himself. And he told me at the time that the plan was to return that coach to um, someplace down there in Waco or Long Beach or someplace. Did, do you know anything yeah. about that? Yeah, that's our coach. That's our, that's the Pullman coach. The all Nicole. right. Yeah, he willed it to the museum when he passed and the museum brought it down there. That's, he, that's what we're trying to preserve. The photograph of the Nakata at the end of the, at the end of the, my presentation is actually the car when it was at, at his place before it came to, before it came to the museum. Oh, oh that's really so, cool. Uh, this is uh, Ephraim Galliano from uh, Ocean Shores area, the other small peninsula. Uh, I was wondering, um, the, the photos you collected, were those mostly from the Historical Society or did you have other sources, friends or, or colleagues that you got them from? Most of those photos are part of the museum's collection. Um, there, are, there are a few in there that we um, got permission to use. Um, I don't know, I, I think out of, out of uh, the Portland area and the Union Pacific, um, that, but most of them are in the, in the museum's collection. We've got a pretty decent collection there and uh, the museum staff keeps unearthing photos that I've never seen before, uh, but um, most of it's from that. Uh, All right, well, thanks Mark for that excellent presentation. Once again, this is the uh, Skagit Valley and Whidbey NMRA Clinic, part of the fourth division of the Pacific Northwest region of the NMRA. And I'm gonna stop the recording now.